Good afternoon again, and I'm uh, again welcome my colleague Ron Dart. And his new book, The Keeper of the Flame, The Canadian Red Tory Toryism, I want to discuss with him a little bit, or interview him more. Uh, Ron Dart is one of the, probably the foremost philosopher of, of genuine red Toryism in Canada, and uh, I, I dare say a direct uh, philosophical descendant of some of our, our great leaders who were developers of the Red Tory tradition in Canada, including George Grant, who was perhaps the most famous of all Canadian philosophers. In, in uh, Rob, Red Toryism is so often misunderstood, even among Tories. <laughs> and I'd like you to give us a little explanation, first of all, about the political aspect, but then I'd like also to bring to mind that there's a very deep and profound spiritual aspect to Red Toryism as well, and we should touch upon it. So can you give us a little idea of, of the kind of Red Toryism upon which Canada was founded, beginning with Sir John A. MacDonald, I believe, and uh, the, the, the political concepts of it? Well, in many ways, the, when most people think or hear the word Red Tory, it's the language, it's the a political language which emerged in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, George Grant had written his, his probably one of the most important political works in Canada. It was published in 1965, uh, Lament for a Nation, mm -hmm. sure. the Defeat of Canadian Nationalism. And it, mm -hmm. it, it came out of the 1963 election where Lester Pearson had lined up with, with Kennedy in the States to bring mm -hmm. down, actually so did Tommy Douglas. Yeah. Uh, Grant actually had been on the phone all night um, before Douglas, he pleaded with Douglas not to vote with Pearson to bring down the Diefenbaker government because he knew that was essentially bringing uh, in American influence yeah. into Canada. Yeah. And Tommy Douglas did vote with Pearson, brought down the Diefenbaker government, yeah. and then, um, of course, Pearson aligned himself with Kennedy. We, we were expected to take uh, warheads for Bullmark missiles and all these. But uh, the new left in Canada, Gad Howards, who's a key figure in this, it, it confused him because his idea of conservatism was right-wing, a lighter state, um, lighter politics, more power to the individual, uh, and all of this sort of sort of thing. And here was someone, George Grant, who, who claimed to be conservative, but he was for a stronger state, uh, a role of higher taxes, a nationalization of industries, and this seemed to be leftist. Mm -hmm. And so, again, uh, Howard's then um, used the language of red Tory, when most people think Tory, um, they think right wing, when most people hear the language of red, mm -hmm. they think left. And so it's an odd uh, bringing together of two traditions that transcends the tribalism of right, center, and left. But in fact, uh, Toryism or red Toryism Canada goes not only back, as you mentioned, to Johnny MacDonald, but when you think of the early battles that took place in Canada of 1812 eight, up to 1814, it was Anglican bishops that were the forefront of trying to keep the, the Americans at bay and create a very different state and country in the northern part of the Americas that would have a greater sense of the common good, the common weal, the role of the state in bringing all, that, all of that about. And of course, conservatism today now from the Stephen Harper variety is very much uh, what most people think of conservatism, right of center, pro-American, uh, free enterprise, lighter state, lighter taxes, and uh, when we think red Tory, which is in many ways foundational to the, to the origins and development of this country, it's increasingly marginalized. So this book, Keepers of the Flame, in one sense, it's an attempt to keep the flame alive of a very old tradition in Canada that goes back to Britain, goes back to France, which is part of the First Nations tradition. Mm -hmm. And so as that fire is dimming with the, with the dominance of a form of blue Toryism, or Republican conservatism in Canada. This book, uh, this book goes into various phases, history, ideas, philosophical, theological, uh, in which uh, in which that flame, even though faint, and sometimes people would argue failing, can still be kept aglow and alive. Yeah, yeah. One thing I like in, in so many of your writings is the way you bring back to people's attention long forgotten great Canadian people of letters. And uh, uh, that uh, Stephen Leacock, who had a profound influence in Canada, one of our great uh, theoreticians, I would say, and writers, uh, far too often forgotten or remembered as a humorist only. 
and not remembered for his in deeper works. Well, yes. Maria Fiumingo, who was, I had uh, cited on some of her lectures at UBC in, in a century ago when I was young, <laughs> and uh, a great uh, Canadian poet of, 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 of the Red Tory tradition as well. Yeah, and we've done, a, we've done an interview on Milton Acorn. Milton Acorn yeah, yeah, he yeah, received yeah. an honorary doctorate the yeah, same yeah. day that Diefenbaker did. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I think I, we have to be grateful to you for bringing these people back to our attention. But I also think it's, it's important, two factors in the foundation of Canada. One, of course, that Bishop Laval in Quebec was ultramontane and not Gallican, that he didn't look to France as a mother country. He looked at the religious connection rather than the, national, than the uh, racial connection. And the Anglican bishops, I've been rather startled at how many people have no idea what the word common wheel means, and they think they'll always, when I write it, uh, an editor will always put commonwealth. And the commonwealth is a political organization. Common wheel is the common good. <laughs> And uh, it's not talking about wealth, it's talking about the wheel of the people, the, the common good of the people. And yet that was so fundamental in the foundation of Canada, and a lot of that did come from Anglican bishops and Anglican uh, churchmen. Well, when you think of the founding of our two nations, the United States was founded primarily by a form of Puritanism, which was mm -hmm. the most extreme form of Puritanism, yeah. the pilgrims. Mm -hmm. um, they priorized very, very much their rights to interpret the Bible contrary to the state and the historic institutions, mm -hmm. in their case, of England. Yeah. And so you get this great suspicion of the historic church, of the historic state in the founding of the United States. Mm -hmm. You don't find the presence of the historic Christian traditions of the West in the United States as having the same significance as in Canada. So the Roman Catholic tradition, or the Episcopal in the States, never has had, particularly in the founding, in fact they were suspicious of that in the States, whereas in Canada, the two dominant forms of, um, of, of Christianity were what we would call the Western Mother Church tradition, the Anglican and Roman Catholic. And what underwrites <coughs> Roman Catholic and Anglican is this concern for catabolus, the good of everyone, the whole, or the Anglican, the common weal. And so the individual is always subordinated to the good of the whole in our founding religious vision. And interesting enough, even though to some degree Canada has been secularized, those underlying principles at their best continue in Canada versus in the States you still get this extreme individualism and liberty and equality and so secularize the two uh, states, the underlying founding genetic code, we, we still have those deeper principles that were planted in the soil by either the Puritans south of us or the Roman Catholic and Anglicans on the north, north of the 49th. You know, the, um, the Canadian healthcare system, which I think is our greatest moral accomplishment as a nation, that we all share the burden for one another. And we do so, we do so willingly. We share the burden for one another. That, uh, in, in a way that, well, Tommy Douglas was the one who brought the system in in Saskatchewan. He was a Baptist minister with two other Baptist ministers. who formed a political party, partly just to keep people from losing their farms because of medical bills. And brought in the system, and as I recall, the reason he voted to bring Diefenbaker down is he'd reached an agreement with, with um, Mike Pearson that Pearson would institute a federal health care system if he voted for him. So he kind of blackmailed him to do it. I, I think uh, Diefenbaker might have done it on his own eventually. But uh, it, it, it strikes me, and perhaps you can shed a little light on it, that even the health care system that we have is a little bit influenced by that, the Anglican uh, ideology of the day, or the Anglican philosophy of the day, about the nature of the state. Oh, definitely. I would, I would argue long before Tommy Douglas was on the scene with the you know, our universal health care system, you just have to read um, one of our Prime Ministers, um, uh, Bennett, his, his, um, you know, his, his um, speeches to the people in which, he, this is a conservative prime minister in the thirties, he just savages capitalism. Mm -hmm. And um, actually Stephen Leacock writes the foreword to the Premier Speaks to the People, Bennett, mm -hmm. and he, I mean, he's, he is so 
uh, committed to a strong state to intervene to distribute wealth. Mm. Uh, you just have to go back to Stephen Leacock, um, an Anglican, and in, in his works, uh, when the, the uh, soldiers are coming back after World War II, you know, very critical of capitalism, mm -hmm. um, very uh, supportive of, of a state to distribute wealth. You can go back of Stephen Leacock to key writers in the 19th century who are Anglicans. And so mm -hmm. you get Leacock, uh, you get Grants, an Anglican, Donald Creighton, a great historian, Maria Fiamingo, Milton Acorn, mm -hmm. Mazza de la Roche, who's buried beside mm -hmm. Stephen Leacock, she's an Anglican. The whole, there's a great um, a communion of high Tory Anglican saints mm -hmm. who laid the foundation in many ways for a common good tradition. Mm -hmm. I might just add too, which often most people don't talk a lot about, is when they think red Tory, it tends to be a political term. Mm -hmm. But red, um, red's roots, as it were, go right into the very life of spirituality, into mm -hmm. the life of the church. And red is the color of martyrdom. It's it's the color of service. It's the, That's it's right. the color That's why we wear red vestments on the feast of martyrs. It's the color of Pentecost. Yeah. It's, the, yeah. it's it's the color of, of of our impurities, of our false, mm -hmm. our selfish side being burned off. So who we really are will emerge, in, which, which is a people who care for one another. Yeah. So yeah. when we begin to explore the spiritual and ecclesial roots of red, which underlie the political side of red, mm -hmm. and often when people talk red tourism, it, it's reduced just to a political term, yeah. whereas deeper than that, I mean, that's the fruit of red, the roots of red are spiritual mm -hmm. and uh, ecclesial, and what red actually means for transformation and deification, mm -hmm. and it's outworking, finding economics and politics. It uh, somehow doesn't strike people that the color of the Republican Party in the United States is red, the color of the Democratic Party is blue, but for those of you who saw the uh, movie Lincoln, we realized that it was the Democrats who wanted to maintain slavery. The Republicans were a, lat uh, a radical kind of leftist party who wanted to bring it into slavery. And uh, it was a Republican movement to end slavery. Uh, it was a Republican movement to regulate the food industry. It was a Republican movement that established the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. It was a Republican who established the uh, national parks in the United States. So there had been a, a, a radical switch in how those things were understood from the beginning. And uh, there was a reason perhaps why the Republican Party colors were red. And those reasons were, had nothing to do with left and right, they had to do with humanity. It was, the Republican Party was in part founded on the principle of abolishing slavery. And uh, it was, uh, you know, the uh, healthcare system that Mr. Obama brought in was inferior to the healthcare system that Richard Nixon wanted to bring in that he proposed in his second term. Uh, his, uh, Richard Nixon, the Republican president, much more far-reaching, much more dominating in his healthcare system, but also much more useful than it was. So, uh, I was going to say also, the, uh, anyone who's seen the recent movie Les Mis Rob, uh, red is the color of those who have suffered and are being oppressed by the wealthy. Yeah. And the revolutionary color is the color of red, which is seeking justice. Yeah. And yeah. so when you, when, you, when you see red, it's usually the color of those who are thinking of the common good of one and all. Yeah. And, and so red, both at a spiritual, red at an ecclesial, red at an economic, a political. Yeah. And so red Tory mm -hmm. is bringing together what is often seen on the right, with the common good is what often is seen as the left, and it's how you marry those two. Well, you know, sometimes I see a comment by some of my critics down in America, they'll say, oh, well, he is a red Tory, you know. <laughs> Je suis monarchiste. But uh, I, I'd like to recommend this book very highly, Keepers of the Flame, and any book you can find by Ron Dark, uh, Keepers of the Flame will give a, uh, an introduction to the spiritual foundations and spiritual roots of Canada, not simply the political roots, and the um, political foundations, because the way you can't separate the two, the way Canada was founded by an evolutionary process rather than a revolutionary process, it was founded by an unfolding of peaceful actions uh, within the concept of peace, order, and good government. So this Keepers of the Flame, it's uh, available uh, in bookstores and likely you can find it by going to Google and find it on some of the uh, online outlets. And 
get it and read it if you're at all interested in the spiritual foundations of Canadian culture and society and even the foundations of our politics. Thank you so much for being with us, Ron. And next time I think we'll discuss a couple of other things. Philip Long's um, Brother Corruption of the Red Tory Ideal. And uh, it, was, it was a pleasure to have you and a pleasure to see this book out.